Hello, everybody. Welcome on the Lights on Data show. Today, we have an amazing guest with us, Dr. Joe. And I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Joe. He has more than 35 years of experience on the stage as an IT and high ed professional. He has served as a business intelligence specialist at the NC State University and is currently serving as senior systems analyst at the NC Department of Health and Human Services, as well as a chief technology officer at Solon Tech Corporation. Additionally, he stays active in the IT community with more than 11,000 LinkedIn followers. He has, uh, he, we are happy to have him as our guest as he is a highly recommended and critically acclaimed international keynote speaker, data viz and an analytics expert, and specialist in efficiency and process improvement. He is indeed a much sought after resource and speaks at dozens of conferences each year. He brings the data to life and life to data. Everyone, please welcome Dr. Joe. Thank you so mm -hmm. much, Diana and George. I appreciate that really, really kind and gracious introduction. We know that you are very busy outside of work as well. Can you share us a little bit what your hobbies are? Sure. Um, well, I like to read books. I play the piano. Um, I like to sing. I, I enjoy working out at the gym. Uh, listening to Star Trek audiobooks, <laughs> um, and most of all, spending time with my wife and family. Uh, those are the things that mean more to me than all the Star Trek or work or anything else uh, in the whole world. There's no substitute for family. That's uh, yeah. And, and we also know that you you really have numerous guest appearances on nationally recognized podcasts, and you're an international speaker, and uh, uh it feels like every other day you're speaking at a conference somewhere as a keynote. Well, you're very kind. It seems that way sometimes. Hey, more like every other week is perhaps a little more, but it's sometimes it's, it feels like pretty much every other day right. going from pillar to post. But yeah, right. I enjoy I, it thoroughly. I know you did say, uh, you know, once that it's it's a busy life indeed, but you wouldn't trade it for anything and that you're a firm believer that if you're not innovating, you're stagnating. In yes, other sir. words, if you don't grow, you die. That's exactly right. <laughs> you're either moving and grooving or you're uh, digging a shovel, you know, uh, digging a hole for yourself, you know. So <laughs> <laughs> very true. I think you're an inspiration to a lot of us. Mm -hmm. So I, I want us to to get into uh, today's podcast and into our topic and, you know, start with this pertinent question. Why do you believe it's so important to overcome biases when it comes to getting from, you know, being in data denial to being data driven. Yeah, uh, George, that's an excellent question. Um, you know, you're, you're you're already looking for insight. Okay, that's um, that's a finding that either contradicts your knowledge, confirms or denies your suspicions, or qualifies the importance of of that knowledge. All right, actionable insight which is necessary for driving decisions, goes a step further, okay? Either leading to adaptation and action or to um, confirm that <laughs> no action is needed in the first place. Okay, now what are those, the, the mental grid or the funnel through which we process those decisions? Well, it's made up of the biases that we have accumulated, developed, nurtured, and cultured over a lifetime of experiences. But left to itself, okay, I see bias as the enemy of opportunity. And, and it's something that I believe we need to overcome. All right. Um, of course, it's a little naive and maybe even a little deceptive to just sit there and say, oh, I'm not biased about anything. You know, that, okay, that's <laughs> not true. Uh, you yeah, know, it's not accurate. It's dishonest to, to even think of that. Okay, see, because scientists tell us that our brains don't put the same amount of attention on every decision we make, but instead, we take what one neuroscientist, um, Chris Weller, I think his name is, he refers to as mental shortcuts. And of course, mm -hmm. we call them biases. So we all have mm -hmm. them. And, and they're, they're, they're the things that make up that grid that I was talking about. Now, in and of themselves, biases are neither good nor bad. They're neutral, right? They can either help us or, or hurt us. Mm -hmm. um, for example, if you're biased 
about making decisions quickly, well, that can help you if you're in a sinking boat, <laughs> but it can hurt you if you're trying to figure out who you're going to marry. All right. You and I both made a good decision <laughs> on that. All right. It, 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 in one of my presentations and driving decisions with data, I, I talk about three of the broad categories of biases that uh, this guy Weller and his colleagues um, have identified in their extensive research on the subject. Um, I believe there are the, the expedience buyer, uh, bias, the experience bias, and the similarity bias. Um, you know, w whatever form these biases might take, all right, really, the best course of action is not to deny them, you can't, uh, or to pretend they don't exist, they do, or to try to get rid of them, you can't, <laughs> but rather to overcome them, um, or at least to mitigate them by taking action, action mm -hmm. like pulling in more information and, and um, reframing the smaller question in the light of a bigger picture. Now, Dr. Jennifer Meyer, Myers, I think it is, she's, um, she's a professor of cardiology at Hofstra University. Um, she advocates five strategies to mitigate bias. And, and one of these is to practice what she calls constructive uncertainty. You know, I, I really like that. I mm. wish we had the time to explore that. But essentially, it involves asking questions from a non-judgmental place, along with checking your assumptions that you've made about yourself and others. Um, so what's the result of doing all that? Well, you get to the place where you can tell yourself, don't just take that that pretty graph or that idea, whatever, at first uh, at face value or upon first glance. OK, check those biases and overcome them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and you said that success in, a, you know, data driven decision making cannot be measured until you've come to the point where the process is repeatable. Yeah. So can you elaborate on that a little bit? Sure thing, uh, George. Um, yeah, it's got to be repeatable in order to be measurable. All right. Um, you can't repeat a process if it hasn't been documented. OK, uh, if you remember that the process worked right and you didn't yeah. write down how you did it, well, then <laughs> how are you going to know if you can do it again? You know, if it's documented, it's repeatable. If it's repeatable, it's measurable. And if it's measurable, well, then, of course, you can stack it up against your key performance indicators, your KPIs, um, so that you can continually look for ways to improve each time around. Mm -hmm. You know, th that takes vigilance. That takes learning. That takes dedication to get it there. Um, Dr. Milton Maddox, he's the chief technology officer at Castle, Castle Shield in Arizona, I believe. Um, I can't remember how he said it, but something like the measure of a process reflecting reliability or no extensibility, I think he said, requires it to be repeatable. That's the whole point. Okay. Otherwise, there's no constant against which that you can measure and compare. Uh, let me illustrate. All right. Think about some of the names of um, that, that would pop into your head when you, when you think about, say, the, the, the greatest basketball players of all time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, uh, maybe names like uh, uh, Michael Jordan, uh, Pete Maravich, uh, uh, Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, LeBron James, Manute Bowl, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Yeah, there's not a basketball fan in this com country who doesn't know at least one or two of these names, maybe all of them if you're a real aficionado. You know, they play... They uh, represent players who were at the top of their game uh, during their own time, respectively. You know, these are yeah, unforgettable yeah. powerhouses of talent and consistency. I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, some of those names, if, if you think about it, you know, they span probably about half a century or so. Each of them was a coach's dream in their own time, you know, totally re irreplaceable. Or were they? OK, think about it. Mm -hmm. With each passing generation, another great comes up and soars to even greater heights than the one before it, you know, uh, only to be replaced by yet another one that does the same thing in the next generation. Now, mm -hmm. uh, don't misunderstand me, okay? I, I still believe that there are some of these guys that are indeed irreplaceable. You know, many have said, oh, there will never be another, uh, you know, fill in the blank with whatever name you want. You know, there'll be another, <laughs> never be another Michael Jordan. There'll never be another, you know, whoever, fill in that blank, right? But, Here's the question, though. Why is it that you can indeed count on, I don't know, the emergence of other phenomenal, talented athletes who are going to continue to wow both spectators and coaches alike? 
Well, there's a reason for that. See, basketball has a repeatable formula for success, and it's taught that same way practically all over the world. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, coaches and institutions are going to have mm -hmm. their own, you know, individual uh, distinctives and personalities, but the underlying basics are the same, right? The fundamentals of the game, um, the, 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 the honing of the skills, the dedication and drive of the players, practice, 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 conditioning, you know, all these factors are going to be consistent and predictable, resulting in outstanding players who consistently excel in spite of the fact that all these guys that I named and, and many more or any other people that you can name, right, uh, who are the greats throughout all time, okay, um, they all come from wildly different backgrounds and situations and coaching and you know okay okay this is a little bit of an oversimplification and of course given enough variations within any situation you're going to find exceptions to every rule but <laughs> at least in a general sense i believe this same principle holds true in building a data driven decision making strategy um mm -hmm. repeatable consistent dependable procedures, even if you might get varied results, will at least, at least get you to the point where you know how to measure success. And, you know, that's the name of the game. Loving it. Yeah. I love the, uh, yeah, the analogy with exactly, basketball. Exactly, exactly. Um, so do you see quantitative data and qualitative data as complementary or contradictory? <laughs> oh, so boy. Can it be used together or should it remain apart? That's an excellent question, Diana. Um, let's see. Well, um, you know, I think um, a majority would hold that you cannot mix the two. No, quantitative, qualitative, no way you can do it. But, you know, I'm convinced that you need both. And 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 when handled the, the right way, you can have both. Now, that might sound a little counterintuitive, right? Because, you know, quantitative and qualitative data are obvious. You know, they're not the same thing. You know, they seem to, it just some, it would, they would seem to be opposites. Yeah, there is truth to that statement. Uh, okay, Qu qualitative data, let's say qualitative data looks at the what or the how many of an issue, right? Whereas qualitative data uh, can be said to look at the why and the even the where of the data. Quantitative data defines, right? You have finite, discrete, measurable values uh, uh, or <laughs> quantities, you know, the word, right? That must be quantified. That's why it's quantified, uh, right? Uh, things that you can count. All right. So where quantitative data is objective, deductive, and, and easier to generalize, mm -hmm. qualitative data is, are, is um, subjective inductive and, and harder to generalize. Uh, I'll give you an example. Let's suppose you own a sporting goods store and, and you wanted to track hiking boot sales over time. Now, that is easily quantifiable, right? You have a specific number of boots for each, oh, I don't know, uh, day, week, month, whatever, whatever period of time that you're looking at. Um, but let's say you wanted to gauge the extent of customer satisfaction with those boots. And, and to do that, well, you'll have to implement, I don't know, some kind of uh, customer experience survey with open-ended questions, asking them to describe the way they feel about those boots, right? That's an example of qualitative or qualitative data. You're going to get some pretty valuable feedback with such a survey, but here's a problem. <laughs> it's not really quantifiable, is it? Okay, so you seem to be stuck, you know, one or the other. What am I going to do? You're not really stuck. Because I believe that these two extremes do not have to stand alone. They can be leveraged together. See, you can enrich the quantitative data and pull more qualifying information from it by asking some more detailed questions in the data gathering phase. That is, um, rather than a simple yes or no question like, did you like the boots, right? <laughs> okay, well, determine the extent of people's opinions by asking to, say, rate the boots on a scale of one to five on, I don't know, several different characteristics. Um, you not only get the discrete values that you can easily plot on, the, on a graph, but you also get more depth in your observations 
and can therefore tease a more detailed, comprehensive, qualitative picture. Okay, let's mm -hmm. flip it on the side. What about that qualitative data or qualitative? Okay, how, how can you quantify something that's so ethereal, you know, subjective, like I said, all right? Um, well, how do you take, say, narrative text, for example, and derive some sort of measurable pattern from it? Well, I would suggest, as others have done, the use of qualitative analysis software. It has the ability to read through massive amounts of text and set up some sort of frequency distribution of words that can then be cataloged and assigned discrete attributes, say, maybe along this same one to five scale, you know, good to bad, soft to hard or tight to loose or whatever other contrasting pairs that you yourself can derive and determine. Now, at that point, having done that, you then have categories that you can measure. Okay, plotting them against, say, the number of people in your population who used those terms, thus gaining greater depth into the dimension of the popularity of that particular term or the lack thereof, if it's not so popular. So, so yeah, it is possible to leverage both the quantitative and the qualitative data together. Um, in a way, you might say it's like blending art and science. You got to have both. I mean, after all, you want to ensure, here's the bottom line, that decision makers have everything they need to drive actionable insight from what's being presented so that they can make a much more informed decision with that fuller, richer data that they get from the quality and the quantity meshed, 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 I can't talk, meshed together. I hope it makes sense. So yeah. yeah, so they go well together. And, you know, back to the first question, we also need to make sure as we are gathering this qualitative, quantitative data points that we're, you know, careful on our biases and how we're gathering it, especially through a survey, but also then how we are interpreting those results uh, through our biases. Absolutely. So, yeah, we need to make sure that we're overcoming it, as you uh, as you said. So nowadays, though, you know, you're interacting with a lot of people, a lot of data professionals. Do you still see that organizations are in data denial? <laughs> a lot of people are in denial about a lot of things, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, George, um, you know, I think it's important to um, start off by looking at the objectives, okay? Uh, objectives that are in front of you, prioritizing them. Um, according to your organization's mission, vision, and goals, um, what's what's the story that's being told, right? Um, then start finding and presenting relative data. You know, your your stakeholders have got to know uh, how the data being presented is relative to the situation at hand, the issue being addressed, the flaw being remediated, the defect being recorded, uh, the concern being discussed or addressed, the problem being resolved, and so forth. Um, then I'd say start drawing conclusions from that data, but not until after you have listened to what the data is telling you, right? And some companies don't do that because they are in data denial. You know, is it an upward or downward tread? Is it a statistical fluctuation? Is there a correlation between items? Is there no correlation between items? Okay. Um, learn how to both look for patterns, but at the same time, question those patterns, you know, uh, are they linear, exponential, uh, stationary, dampen, seasonal, random, cyclical, uh, or, or whatever, okay? Um, let's see, fourth, I guess that's, yeah, I'm losing track, well, whatever, yeah, yeah, leverage what you've gathered, okay, to keep you from getting into that data denial. Plan that strategy, put what you have so far into practice. Um, and uh, I'd say measure your success and once again, repeat. OK, you know, it, it's not really a matter of ignoring the data. OK, they just don't have it. Um, if they know their business, these people that are in denial, you know, their products, their clients, their competition, their seasonal cycles, if any, their 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 supply lines, their distribution network, their employee makeup, you know, other things. Right. They can indeed use their experience with each one of these components or mm -hmm. groups of components or even all of them taken as a whole, right, um, to drive their decisions. 
you know, um, people who do that, well, they're, they might sit there and claim that they're not using data in data denial, as I say. Uh, but guess what all those components are that I just named? Uh, well, definitely, I think they're data, right? They're, that's what I'm talking about, right? You know, to the purest, to the purest, maybe not in the conventional sense of, you know, spreadsheets, databases, web-based business intelligence reports, bar charts, and that kind of thing. You know, it's not all written down in some organized, formalized fashion. But hey, there's still information of some type that's recorded in some way. And these are pieces of information or data, if you will, from which decision makers draw insight. Um, so a different scenario, rather than being in data denial, say another business, they've got gobs of data, but I don't know, maybe they've had a bad experience with either flawed data co collection methods or flawed reporting methods. Uh, you know, they might get to the point where they don't trust the data. I mean, how can you believe something that you don't trust? OK, um, so they might be driven to ignore the data, you know, like, like you talked about the data denial. OK, um, but instead they rely on their intuition until those issues can be resolved. So, yeah, wrong data leads to wrong decisions. Right. And those wrong decisions uh, can lead to undesi uh, undesirable, even disastrous consequences. Because once you've had an experience like that, well, yeah, sure, it's going to leave a bad taste in your mouth, and you're going to think twice before going down that road again. Okay. Now, of course, um, rather than giving up on, on the data together and deny, the right approach is to find the problem, address the concern, fix that defect, implement reliable, accurate, and consistent practices like the ones I talked about that are going to win back the trust of the decision makers. Okay, we, we talked earlier about insight and biases, you know, that, that grid or filter that I talked about yeah. before yeah. that... Um, you know, through which we process our decisions. Okay, some of us have really good instincts and and sound intuition, a good gut. Okay, uh, you know, I guess developed, honed, and improved upon with experience. So, while going with your gut might seem like the right way to go, <laughs> yeah, let's not forget that your gut, your instinct, your intuition, all that stuff needs to be informed in order to be reliable. And the best way to do that. Well, is with accurate, unadulterated, unmanipulated, actionable data. Well said, Dr. Joe. I, I hope more managers will listen to you and they'll just make more data-driven decisions. Yeah, and talking about data-driven decisions, I wanted to ask, do you think that most people only refer to strategic decisions or operational ones as well? Sure. Um, that's a great question, Diana. Um, strategic versus operational. Okay. You know what? I'll give you the best answer that any technical person can give. You ready? It depends. <laughs> right? We always say it. it depends. Okay. Right. Yeah. No, but seriously, it really does depend. All right. Look, um, those who are focusing on longer term goals and, and the big picture tend to look at ways that data will drive their strategic decisions. While those who are interested in how to get there, how to get from point A to point B on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, they're more honed in. Well, they're going to focus on ways that data can drive their operational decisions. Some would refer to them as their tactical decisions. You know, I, I think it's easy to see how looking at overarching or long-term trends in your organization's data can inform strategic decisions for high level planning. You know, you, you can't live without it. You know, you see the general direction in which your lines of business are going. So you plan your strategy and you try to get all the chess pieces, you know, put into the right places, you know, to make it happen for your long term goals and your bigger objectives. Okay. That's the strategic mm -hmm. approach. However, even at the executive level, I think there's a danger of overemphasizing that high level strategic look, you know, especially, mm -hmm. especially if it leads you to lose sight of all the pieces, parts and steps that you need to have in place uh, day by day to 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 get there. 
All right. Um, let's see. Uh, you know, that's that's what helped break break down those long term goals into the smaller, more immediate ones that you need to 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 strive for incrementally to get to those higher level ones. Right. How do you eat an elephant one piece at a time? You know, <laughs> the long term goals, you got to know what those short term goals are to get to those long. Goals. See, the more granular data about these ongoing operational items can inform those tactical decisions in the same way. See, I'm convinced that you need both, okay, both the tactical and the strategic to have a balanced perspective for both the long term and the short term, both the overall picture and the day to day operations. Um, I really like what ancient Chinese general military strategist and philosopher Sun Tzu once said. He said this strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory. Tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. Mm -hmm. You know what? A after more than 25 centuries, I believe that is still great advice to this day for people who need to be able to balance both the strategic and the tactical, both the big picture and the operational. Wow. I, I, I love this answer. We can quote you. We can. <laughs> yeah. oh, for You're sure. very and kind, Diana. Every yeah. answer where we're learning so much from you. And as Robert here is mentioning, I could listen to Dr. Joe all day, and I agree. Um, and yes, You're very kind great, to say that. Thank you. Great conversation, indeed. So, uh, Dr. Joe, from what I've noticed, really, when, when the data is really contradic contradicting that status quo, uh, mm -hmm. management or some management, they really see it as a threat or that's their immediate reaction. You know, they start to become adverse yeah. to it and they're like, okay, I'm, I'm not liking this. Uh, let's do something else. And so yeah, the do you have any advice? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And do you have any advice how we can convince management to really embrace it as a good thing? Because it's a good thing contradicting the status quo. Okay. Maybe it's not something that we desire, but if mm -hmm. that's what the data tells us, you know, we should take it as an opportunity and go with it. So do Absolutely. you have any any advice on how to convince them to, you know, see it as a good thing and not as a threat? Absolutely. That's an excellent question. OK, the status quo, it's a it's a perception that things are going to stay the way they are. OK, we all know that. Now, if if management believes that things are going well, mm -hmm. well, then that status quo perception might just lull them into complacency, right? They're, they're going to get themselves stuck in a rut, okay, I, I, in which they keep on doing things the way they've always done them. Um, a, a supervisor, uh, one of my bosses back in the day, uh, years ago, he used to say this, if you keep doing what you've been doing, you're going to keep getting what you've been getting. <laughs> and nothing could be, you know, they, that's exactly right. Uh, another person has said a rut is nothing more than a grave with both ends knocked out of it. You know, we, we don't want to hold to the status quo. I'd rather overthrow the status quo. You know, uh, Machiavelli has been quoted as saying, I'm not interested in preserving the status quo. I want to overthrow it. You know, whether he actually said that or not, it, it's a good sentiment. It is. Uh, it shouldn't mm -hmm. be viewed as a threat. You know, um, people who are, you know, they might just lose touch with reality. They're going to shut down new ideas that they perceive as that they perceive as threatening, as you alluded to, George. But, yeah, you know, yeah. the, the numbers don't lie. OK, the data is either going to challenge or contradict the status quo. And the only way that we can get management to wake up and smell the roses is to show them that changing their strategy is in their own best interest. See, when they see that maybe sales are decreasing, overall revenue, profit, margins, you know, whatever their KPIs happen to be, uh, that is going in the wrong direction is the point. And they realize that if they continue along that same path that they've been going, whether it's same or different, whatever, it's only going to lead them to disaster. And that fact, if it is presented, if it is shown to them in a, in a, in a transparent, unambiguous, unassuming, visually compelling, neutral and, and totally accurate manner, mm -hmm. well, then the savvy manager is going to see the logic and the wisdom in deriving that actionable insight from something that is indeed in their own best interests and that of the company, regardless of what it does to the status quo. And once you've earned their trust in, in that respect, well, then that's 90% 90, 90 of the battle right there. 
Yeah, I love the fact that you said neutral. So not mm -hmm. accusing anyone of anything right. that happened in the past, but rather absolutely looking towards the future. Okay, what Yes, ma'am. Right. With... Don't make it personal. You know, it's yeah. not about them. It's not about their style. It's not about their personality. It's about what does the information tell you? What story is the data telling you? I don't care about your decisions were right or wrong. I don't care that you're arrogant and stuck on yourself or you're <laughs> humble and kind, uh, you're mean to your employees, nice to your employees. That may be true. That may not, you know, whatever. Leave that totally out of the equation. Rather than making it about personalities, rather than making it about questioning the leadership style, show what the data actually says. Show what the results are going to be if you continue on this same path. I don't care if you're a great boss or a lousy boss. I don't care if you're an awesome person or if you're Genghis Khan. You know, I don't care if you're the best thing since sliced bread or if you're worse than the spawn of the devil. You know, I could care less how I feel about you. You know, if I'm presenting the data, I've got to set all that aside and let the data speak for itself. Let them see. Here's the story that's being told. Here's the picture that's being painted. Here's the course that's being laid. Here's the action that may or may not be taken. You're going to have to change course if you want to avert disaster, regardless of how you might feel about the status quo. Beautiful, he said, and Tenny here agrees as well, and uh, Ali as well. I think everybody really agrees with your method, and again, I hope more and more people really listen to Dr. Joe. Um, Thank you, sir. And I could see why you were at a conference, you know, every week. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Almost, not quite. <laughs> yeah. So... Um, my one of my passions is data governance. It's it's what I do on a day to day basis, and I yes. wonder really, do you do you think that you know data governance, but along with data quality and other data management practices, mm -hmm. should be in place before starting to make data driven decisions, or should they somehow you know go in tandem at the same time? You're starting to make those uh, decisions, data driven decisions, at the same time at implementing these uh, these practices. Uh, that's a loaded question, um, it George. Is, it is. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, and and I'll answer this one the same way I, I answer other things. Once again, um, <laughs> it it depends. All right, yeah, yeah. I'll answer it this way. I believe um, data can and should be used to drive decisions. Period. Uh, well, I put a period on that, but really there is no period. I, I've got to I've got to add a caveat to that. Okay, as long as it's good data, reliable data that's presented in a consistent, logical, and again, I keep telling, I keep saying this, visually compelling. I'll say that a million times. You know, um, data that doesn't try to tell a story that's not there, um, that's done with full disclosure and transparency. Um, and, of course, follow all these other best practices that we've been talking about um, today. OK, but 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 the question remains, can data be gathered, prepared and presented in the way I just described without having at least some sort of data governance, data quality and uh, uh, the other thing you uh, uh, data management practices already in place? Well, probably, probably not. not. Nope. But 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 let's flip it on its side, though. Can organizations be using and practicing good principles of data governments, uh, governments, governance, <laughs> data quality, data management without necessarily having them formulated and, and documented in a, in a body of knowledge? Well, probably so. You know, uh, to those organizations in that first group, I say, good for you. More power to you. You know, keep it up. Mm -hmm. um, to those organizations in that second group, I say, hey, look, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing it right with data governance. And so you know, write it down for heaven's sakes. All right. <laughs> and to those organizations that are in neither of these two groups, you know what I say to them? I say, look, folks, wake up, get with a program before you get your rear end handed to you, because that's what's going to happen. <laughs> Absolutely. Because like Tanya here is mentioning, otherwise, you know, the garbage in, garbage out. Yes, exactly. Through. 
exactly. You're going to get what you deserve. You know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But you're right. I mean, I do see organizations that they they have some sort of a data governance in place, though they're not mm -hmm. calling it as such, or they're not really practicing, right. you know, they don't have the structure for it, but they're doing it. Even, you know, managing projects without a project management office, but they somehow manage it, maybe not by the waterfall uh, procedure or uh, methodology or the agile, but it, it, it works for them. Right. So yeah, exactly. keep, keep it going. And same for uh, data management, data governance, data quality, and so forth. I agree but 100%. For, 99% of organizations, probably that's not, doesn't hold true. It's harder without having uh, a structure in place for sure. Agreed. Some kind, you know, even if it's not written, some kind of structure, some kind of guiding principle that does inform how you're going uh, yeah. about, you know, doing things. You know, are, are you maintaining true transparency? Are you maintaining um, and ensuring that there's only going to be one version of the truth, you know, when you're reporting mm -hmm. the data and without some sort of data government governance, or I can't say that word, data <laughs> governance or data management in place, then you're, you're going to have a hard time uh, keeping to that commitment of presenting one version of the truth consistently uh, if, if those principles are not in place. So get it done. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. So I find that you give a lot of examples. You have a lot of um, catchphrases, which you know <laughs> stick with people, and that's that's amazing. And I, I wanted to ask you um, about some success stories or mm -hmm. some stories that you've encountered. I find that those are, are really really stick with people. So, can you share any stories on how data drives decision making? Anything that comes sure. to mind? Sure, sure, Diana. Um, story well um once upon a time goldilocks and no <laughs> a funny thing happened to me on the way to the data <laughs> sorry no no no. yeah <laughs> well you're very kind I'll, the the catchphrases and the things that that's the educator in me you know i was an educator for 10 years before i got into it and so sure that's is. going to inform your kind <laughs> no that's that's going to inform how i present things and how i try to uh, you know, make things easier to remember through the use of alliteration and rhyming and catchy phrases and that kind of thing and trying to express things in a way that uh, uh, that are good takeaways for folks. So um, but thank you for mentioning that. stories. Uh, got a million of them, but I'll tell you what, here's here's one that's um, uh, my favorite and not necessarily one that I've personally experienced, but um, um, there's um, uh, and, and it's good. Um, Dartmouth College professor. Um, what's his name? Charles Wheeler, Wheeler, Wheeler. Anyway, he, he cited a practical yet extraordinary example of, of this data driven decision making. He heard about a p police department in Santa Cruz, California that claimed that they had solved a crime before it even happened. Like, how can they do that? You know, I mean, they were not cha channeling their inner Tom Cruise, you know, from the Minor yeah, Minority yeah, Report exactly. movie. Right? Yeah, <laughs> right, right, yeah, yeah. No, they were just applying skill with data in recognizing patterns. OK, and then using that to drive their decisions about deploying resources. Um, anyway, by looking at mountains of crime data and determining when and where these crimes were happening more, most often, they started dispatching more officers to those specific locations at those times or prior to those times. Well, as it turns out, one of those locations was a parking garage where there had been quite a few car break-ins over the previous couple of months. Well, guess what? While on patrol, the officers spotted a couple of suspicious looking women, not men at this time, but women loitering near a car. Uh, it gets better. <laughs> One of these women had an outstanding warrant for her arrest, and the other one had drugs on her. So they arrested them both before either one of them had a chance to break into that car, which they were indeed planning on doing. You know, okay, wow. crystal ball, uh, no way. Genius, well, maybe. Nostradamus, uh, nope, not a chance. You know, none of the above. Well, well, except for maybe the genius of of what they did. You know, it, it was just smart people using data in a smart way to spot those patterns, then allowing the insight that they gained from this actionable data to, once again, drive their decisions about the resources that they were able to allocate and put into the right places 
where they would likely do the most good. And in fact, they did. Actionable data at work, you know, data that drove their decisions and it drove them in the right direction. Love it. It's an excellent story. Yeah. Th this reminds me of, a, of, a, of another story with the city. I forgot where it was in the U.S. And uh, this is where the bias comes in that we talked about at the beginning of this session. Mm -hmm. So, again, I forgot what city it was, but every year they were, you know, filling potholes, maybe thousands of potholes. And to do so, they were dispatching their their city workers to kind of you know see where there's a pothole to be fixed and filled up and all that stuff and uh this was maybe 10 15 years ago at the um really the rise of the smartphones era and there were you know the iphones were kind of just turning out and having all these apps and everything so they thought let's develop this app and we're gonna give the power to the people so that as they're walking on the streets and they're seeing a pothole they could just you know photograph it geocode it send it to us through the through the app and we'll know and we'll just dispatch somebody there uh quick quicker without having for us to pay people to kind of walk around and see where there's an issue and mm. so they've done that and was successful but what they found out at the end of the year is they were only fixing potholes in rich neighborhoods why because the people that could afford the phones at the time probably even now too they were right. They were, they had to be rich, so they were living oh. in more, um, ri richer neighborhoods. So then, all these other neighborhoods were being, you know, shafted okay. exactly because they didn't have the population uh, necessary to use the smartphones and to use the app and uh, send them, send them the data. So it was a bias, but it was a data driven decision. But it had the bias in there that they haven't thought of. Yeah, uh, an unanticipated contingency yeah, that yeah, <laughs> that the very yeah. people that they were wanting to help ended up getting, you know, ignored, as you said. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Like Susan uh, saying here, it's it's all about the uh, the data karma. Um, oh, and That's they right. do need to get their code on. Which uh, Susan, you got to remind us what the acronym stands for. Oh man, Susan Walsh, dirty data. I love, I love the way she says that. <laughs> Susan, you're you're a genius. Uh, yeah, the 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 ac I can't remember what the acronym is, but I did. I heard it at one of the one of the conferences that I spoke at. And uh, Jose here saying that uh, George and uh, Dana, I assume, thanks yeah. for the great <laughs> talk with uh, Dr. Joe Perez. Thank you, Dr. Joe. I have another yes, question for Dr. Joe. Dr. Yes, Joe, sure, you have Diana. a lot of energy. You have a lot of <laughs> passion. You have. Where does this all come from? Well, I, um, you know, I, I just have a joy for communicating. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the, the way I figure it, if people are going to give up their time to to come to a conference or to tune in to a show like like yours, uh, you know, they're giving up their time and they want something in return. The very least that I could do is something that I enjoy so much is presented with a passion so that hopefully I could ignite that same passion in them, you know, passion for the actionability of data, passion for uh, bringing data to life and life to data, as my tagline says, you know, uh, and, and, and for all these other things. So it just really motivates me to know that if somehow I've made a positive impact on somebody, if somehow I've made their day brighter, if somehow I've shown them how to do something they didn't know before or gain some insight that they were hoping to get, then, uh, you know, knowing that they're better off after they walked into a room where I'm at than they were before they came into that room, then, hey, that just spurs me on to, uh, uh, you know, to drive myself even even more. Beautiful. And it's just so mentioning beautiful. amen to that. And uh, she she did um, uh, let us know what code stands for, consistent, organized, accurate, and trustworthy. Oh, I it. love it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. So I want to encourage everybody, if you're not following Dr. Joe on LinkedIn yet, please do. You can see he's always delivering amazing information, content, and uh yeah, please it's just follow him on LinkedIn. such a beautiful and easy to follow way. So I think this is a great, great skill, especially in this field of data, where you make things interesting. It's easy to listen to you. It's easy to follow and to understand, oh, especially through all these metaphors that you're using and catchphrases and alliterations, as you said. It's it's great. And um, 
George always asks me, how, how can I be more engaging? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, well, you know, you so, can... see, that's just it. You and I, uh, George, you, you can. You're, you're already engaging. I just enjoy listening to you so much. You guys are just so so kind and gracious to say such such kind things about me. Um, it, it, the, the biggest secret, for those who don't know, see, George's wife has the same name as my wife. She just spells mm -hmm. it differently. My wife spells it with two N's. And, you know, when you have an amazing wife who just loves you to death and everything, then, hey, you know, you're, you're going to strive to do even better. So, uh, you know, uh, yeah, motivate and say, uh, every time you look at that sweet face of that lady you married, just say, I'm going to do even better. You know, I, I'm just going to knock it out of the park today. So, I don't know, maybe that that that's part of it. But, yeah, I, I just enjoy doing this so very much. Uh, you know, I'm just so honored and pleased and bewildered and grateful and and surprised and and humbled and all that kind of stuff all at the same time uh by you guys being so kind to me and allowing me to be on your show um and 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 express myself in in this way to uh uh to hopefully help people see the importance of actionable data and and how it can drive their decisions and 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 how it is an, an important part of the business cycle and your uh, uh your life for that matter Yes. Yeah. No. And thank you so much for for the kind words, uh, Dr. Joe. And I, I admire yes, you for touching so many people. Right. So you're you're speaking at you're so many so conferences. Kind. You're participating in all kinds of uh, podcasts and speaking engagements. And I think this is very rewarding. So I think this makes um, what what you do and what we do uh, meaningful, right? Because ultimately, that's what what we're striving for, right? Yes, ma'am. To improve people's work life and life and if if even if one person is touched and uh, their life is improved then uh, it's all worth it absolutely. i couldn't agree with you more diana absolutely and, and dr joe is an inspiration for me as you know uh diana and yes we do have diana perez here hi. Uh, <laughs> dr. Hi, joe's hi. Other half. Oh. here's a surprise for you dr. oh joe. what a surprise that is so sweet oh my gosh <laughs> Hey, sweetheart. Oh, man, I'm going to embarrass myself now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, I see that. It's written across the bottom. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. That's what I get for not looking at the camera. Oh, gosh. Now I'm, now I'm all flustered. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I'm still well, madly in love with my wife. We just celebrated our 37th anniversary last week. Oh, yeah, I went to the mountains, had a wonderful time, and uh, uh, I, I just rejoice in the, in the wonderful amazing woman that God brought into my life. She's the best thing that's ever happened to me. Uh, my absolute best friend, mother of my children, soulmate. Oh, good heavens. My inspiration, my life, my everything. I, I just love that lady. She's, so, she's so a good. real princess. And, and I'm just so <laughs> grateful that she, that she surprised me and came on there and see, boy, that's, that's neat. I, I'm going to, I'm going to treasure that. That's, that's cool. That's cool. So I'll be quiet fun. now. I'm sorry. Don't get me started about my wife. You, you will never get me here. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Well, thank yep. you, Dana, for joining in. And thank you so much, Dr. Joe, for everything. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in today and for, you know, learning from Dr. Joe. Again, please follow him on LinkedIn and uh, join us in a couple of weeks. I think we're going to take a, a break next week, next Friday, as it's going to be uh, Canada Day on the day before. So we're just going to have a long weekend instead. Thank right, you so everybody. much, everyone, for joining. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Sue. Thanks so much, Thank Dr. Joe. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. <laughs>